So good to see all of you here this morning worshiping with us. I want to encourage you, take out your Bibles. Open to Romans chapter 8, or you may have an iPad or a smartphone. You can open up your app, your Bible app. Turn to Romans chapter 8. And also, take out your Bible study outlines on the back of your bulletin. You're going to want to follow along. You can take notes here on this outline. I encourage you to do that. As most of you know, we're in a series this summer through Romans chapter 8. It's one of the most incredible chapters in the entire Bible, one of the most encouraging chapters in the entire Bible. And now we are on the home stretch. We're just two messages away from completing this series in Romans chapter 8. And basically what the Apostle Paul is going to do is he's going to say, now I want you to know just how blessed you are. <laughs> I mean, I want you to understand how secure you are in your relationship with Almighty God. And what we're going to do, we're going to overriding principle today is just simply this. God is for you. That's what we're talking about today. God is for you. Now, when I was thinking about this message this week, I happened to see a picture of the graduation of the Naval Academy. I see it up there. And basically, you know, they have this tradition that as soon as, you know, they pronounce the graduation, they all stand up in unison and they all throw their caps or hats in the air. And that picture right there captures that moment. But I don't want you to focus on the caps in the air. What I want you to see are some of the expressions on their face. You see that? They're like, yes! Hallelujah, right? I mean, that's basically what's going on there, okay? Now, can I just tell you something? That if you, as a follower of Jesus Christ, really understood what we're gonna study in today's passage, you'd stand up and throw your cap in the air. You'd go, whoa, hallelujah. You may do a David dance. I don't know, but man, you would be moved. It's one of the most encouraging passages in the entire Bible. In fact, it's so good, it's hard to believe it's true. But it is. It's the Word of God. Check it out. Look at how this is written in Romans chapter 8, beginning verse 31. This is for true followers of Jesus Christ. This isn't for the world. This is for you if you're a follower of Jesus Christ. Look at these promises. Verse 31. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God's the one who justifies. Who's the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died. Yes, rather, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. Now, obviously, y'all didn't get it because nobody stood up and go, whoa, right? And so today, I want you to get it, all right? And so I'm gonna teach this to you so you understand just how blessed it is to the reality that God is for you. Now, this is what we wanna understand. We said in the book of Romans, Paul deals with two big issues in the Christian's life. How does a Christian deal with sin and how does a Christian deal with suffering? We're in the suffering section here. And so what happens is, is that whenever we're going through a hard time, whenever we're suffering, whenever we're hurting, Satan will plant three typical lies in our mind. And probably every one of you at one time or another, one of these three lies was in your mind. And what Satan will do is whenever you're hurting, he'll plant one of these three um, lies in your mind. I'll put them on the top of your outline. I want you to jot them down real quick. The first lie is this, God doesn't care. I mean, obviously God doesn't care. I mean, if God really cared, he'd be doing something about this. I mean, maybe this problem's too big for God. Or, or you know what? Maybe just God doesn't care. Maybe, maybe there is no God. You know what? You're just all by yourself in this problem. That's the first lie. It's a lie against God. The second lie is against you. What is it? It's your fault. It's all your fault. I mean, basically, you know what? The reason why you're in the mess you're in is because of you. It's your fault. And you know what? This is an easy lie to believe because we're all sinners. We've all blown it. We've all messed up. And we go, well, sure, I guess this is, the, you know, there. I blew it right there. This is, I'm getting what I deserve, right? And sometimes the accusations of Satan are more powerful than the promises of God. So the first lie is against God. Second lie is against you. Third lie is against your circumstances, about your circumstances. And the lie basically says this, it's hopeless. It's hopeless, you're never gonna change. Circumstances are never gonna change. Things are never gonna get any better. You know what, God has abandoned you. There's absolutely no hope. Those are the lies of Satan. Now, you know how the Bible describes Satan? 
as a thief who comes to steal, kill, and destroy. That's his job description. And he is out to destroy you. And I guarantee if you believe one of these three lies that I've just listed there, if you believe them, he's got you. And you will not live a victorious Christian life if you believe one of those three lies. Well, here's the good news. The Apostle Paul in the text that I just read answers all three of those lies. Paul is going to give you the counter truth to every one of those lies. And the Bible says that the truth will set you free. And the overriding truth of today is what? God is for you. Now, I want you to get that. In fact, this is what I want you to do. I want you to turn to the person next to you and remind them that. Just say, God is for you. Do that right now. God is for you. Now, I don't know about you. I need to hear that from time to time. I do. Now, you may go, okay, awesome, God's for me, but what difference does that make? I mean, God's up in heaven, and I'm down here struggling on earth. How is it that God is for me? What difference does that make? Well, I want you to see three different ways that Paul tells us in this text that God is for us, okay? Here they are. Number one is this. God is for you, first of all, in times of opposition. God is for you in times of opposition. Have there ever been those times that you feel like, you know what, everybody's against me. This is just crazy. I mean, I'm just, I got pressure and stress from every side. I mean, it just goes from bad to worse in my life. Ever feel like there's been times of opposition? Well, Paul addresses that very first thing. Verse 31, he says, what shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? And you outline, circle the word against. Because sometimes we feel like the world is just against us. It may be sin. It may be selfishness and Satan, or it may be sickness. I mean, it could be people, could be problems, could be politicians, right? I mean, and it leads to what? Stress and fear and anxiety and depression. And Paul says, whenever everybody's against you, you need to remember something. God is for you. The God of the universe is in your corner. In fact, I love the way the apostle John puts it this way. In 1 John 4, 4, he says this, greater is he that is in you than he that's in the world. God is on your side. Now, let me see if I can illustrate it like this. Um, As most of you know, our students put on a golf tournament every year, and they do that to raise money for missions. And typically, the way they organize the golf tournament is that they have a team made up of four people, and you play best ball. Now, that just happens to be the only way I play golf because I stink at golf. But if I got a couple of decent people on my team, I still feel like, hey, we're, we're competitive here. You know, this is awesome, you know? And I stink, but if I get a couple of good team members, I feel like, hey, I can still be a winner here, right? But what would happen if I could somehow hook these two guys, Jordan Spieth and Rory McIlroy, to be on my team this next year? You know what? I would win. I would win. I stink, but I would win. And you know what I would do? I'd start bragging right now. I'd go, we're gonna crush you. We're gonna crush you. I'm gonna beat you so bad, you're gonna cry like a little girl. That's what I'd say, right? (laughs) Why, because I'm so good at golf? No, because I got these superstars on my team. Well, the apostle Paul is saying that God is on your team. If God's for you, the God of the universe, if he's for you, Who can stand against you? Nobody can stand against you. Why? Because God's for you. This week I read about a pastor who moved from the south up to Michigan and he pastored a church just outside of Detroit and things were really going good at the church but um, his teenage son was having problems at school. He was, you know, smaller in statue, and a lot of the other kids were picking on him. Let's pick on the pastor's boy. And man, they were just literally making his life miserable. It was just, it was just terrible how bad it got. In fact, it got so bad, there were occasions where the boy would come home and he wouldn't even have a shirt. They had stolen his shirt. Well, you know, the pastor and his wife, you know, they're, they're, their whole family's in turmoil. And they're sharing that request of the church. And just so happened that in their church, there was a boy named Mike. And Mike goes to that school. And Mike is the biggest and strongest athlete in that school. And he, he-, he hears how they're treating the pastor's son, David. And so he finds out who the bullies are, and he goes to them. And he says, I'm telling you what. You mess with David again, I'm going to beat the crud out of you. Do you understand me? You look at him crossways, and I'm going to hunt you down. Do you understand that? 
And so he then leaves the bullies and goes to the pastor's home and says, Pastor, um, I've warned the bullies and I think that they're not gonna mess with David anymore, okay? And so, you know, they felt great. Well, the very next day, David goes to school and he goes to school with amazing confidence. Why? Because he knows Mike is on his side. Can I tell you something? You multiply that by a billion times. The God of the universe is on your side. And I don't care what you're gonna walk through this next week. I don't care what doors you may encounter. The God of the universe is gonna be there. He's on your side. Now listen, Satan will say, well, you know what? You're suffering. God's not on your side. God doesn't care, right? You know what? The Bible says, here's the promise. In times of opposition, here's God's promise to you. Jot it down. God provides. God provides. In times of op in opposition, God provides. Now, what Paul's gonna do here, he's basically gonna say, look at how much God provides for you. God has actually laid down the life of his son for you. If God's willing to give you his son, don't you think he's willing to take care of everything else in your life? Of course, check it out. It's an amazing verse. Look at verse 32. He, that's God, who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? I mean, what Paul's saying is this. If God was willing to give you his best, don't you think he's gonna take care of the rest? Let me say that again. If God is willing to give you his best, don't you think he's willing to take care of the rest? Of course he is. I mean, imagine it like this. Imagine if you have a husband who decides to buy his wife this amazing diamond necklace, right? I mean, it's just gorgeous, it's just amazing. She opens up, sees it and goes, oh my goodness, this is just extravagant. I can't believe it, this is the most beautiful thing you've ever given me in my life. This is just an amazing diamond necklace. And I love the little box it's in too. And he says, well, hang on, I want the box. I mean, you can have the necklace, but, but I, I want the box. Now, would a husband ever do that? Of course not. I mean, if you're willing to give somebody a diamond necklace, I think you'll throw in the box, right? If God has laid down the diamond of his son, don't you think he's gonna throw the box in? That's what Paul's saying. He will give you all that you need, all those things. Now, now listen, God's been willing to lay down his life for you. That's what the Bible teaches us. It's an amazing love. Now, I've gotta be honest with you. I probably wouldn't. Now, I'm just being honest. Don't email me, okay? <laughs> but don't expect me to take a bullet for you, okay? I mean, if it comes down, and I definitely ain't putting my children before, you know, you, know, you before my children. I mean, if it comes down to you and my kids in front of a train, I'm pushing you, okay? Get that? <laughs> Aren't you glad I'm not God? <laughs> but God, on the other hand, says, I'm willing to give you my best. I'm willing to lay down my most precious thing I have for you, right? I mean, look at it. Romans chapter five, verse eight, Paul says this, but God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, while our hand is still clenched in rebellion, Christ died for us. If you wanna know how much God loves you, you just look at the cross. It's his greatest gift. And because God is willing to give you his greatest gift, don't you think he's willing to take care of your other needs as well? Of course he will. I love how the apostle Paul puts this at the beginning of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter one, verse three, Paul says this. God has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms. Why? Because we are united with Christ. What does that mean? That means you're a spiritual zillionaire. That's what it means. And yet most of us as Christians, we do not live that way. Now, let me see if I can illustrate it like this. Imagine that I put on this banquet. I mean, this is a feast. I mean, there's this amazing food. I just lay out this you know, huge buffet. And I go through the highways and byways and I'm, I'm trying to find homeless people and I'm bringing them in and I'm saying, hey, you know what? Here's a feast for you. And I want you to eat all you want and you just take some home. I mean, you just, you, just, you, just, you just dig in, you go back for seconds or thirds, it's all yours, go for it, it's yours. This banquet's for you. And what if one of the homeless folks looks at me and then says, um, hey, uh, do you mind if I, I go to the kitchen and go through the garbage can? I go, what? 
He goes, yeah, yeah, I think there's an apple core in there that I want to chew on, and, and there's a can of beans that's emptied. I just want to lick the lid, and I want to go through the garbage and see if there's anything good in it. Now, does that make absolutely any sense at all? Of course not. It makes no sense at all. And yet, can I tell you, that's how many Christians live? I mean, we've believed about this much of the gospel. Okay, Jesus died so that I can be forgiven. That's about all we believe. That's it. The Bible says you've been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realm. If God's given you his best, don't you think he's gonna take care of the rest? And yet most of us, Satan has convinced us, no, there's not. And we go, okay, what we think is God has laid down his feast for us and we think the Christian life is a life of famine. God has laid out joy and peace and life and we think the Christian life is drudgery. God has given us a path to victory in Jesus Christ and we live a life of defeat. And so what happens is, is that many times we as pastors, we gotta spend a lot of our time going, hey, get out of the garbage can. Would you stay out of that garbage? Would you quit eating that garbage? Would you quit going to that garbage? Why? Because that's where we think life is. The garbage is not where you're gonna find life. It's found in Jesus Christ alone. And if God has given you his son, don't you think he's gonna take care of everything else? He will. I mean, look at that passage again. If God did not spare his son for you, how will he not also freely give us all things? God has invited us to the feast. We believe the lies of Satan, but I want you to know in times of opposition, whenever you're struggling, don't run to the garbage can, run to almighty God and say, God, I need you, I need your help, I need your security, I need your life, I need your love, I need your power, I need you, and he will give you all things at that moment. But you gotta get out of the garbage and go to the feast. So God's for you, he is. In times of opposition, he'll provide. But there's a second truth here. God's also for you when, jot this down, in times of accusation. In times of accusation. Now, I don't know about you, but there have been these times where these thoughts come into my mind, accusatory thoughts. Now, you're probably more godly than I am, but these thoughts will come and go, oh, how can you call yourself a Christian? I mean, you're such a hypocrite. You really think God's gonna answer that prayer? I mean, you have sinned that sin just once too often, that's it. And these accusatory thoughts come in your head, right? Well, Paul answers that question. What happens in times of accusation? Well, check it out. Look at how Paul puts this in verse 33. He says this, who will bring a charge against God's elect? Circle the word charge there. You know what that means? It just simply means an accusation. It means an accusation. Now, most of you probably know this, that we're in the middle of a political presidential campaign. Did anybody know that? You knew that, right? And I'm about sick of it, right? I mean, I'm just, we got four more months of this trash. And you know what a lot of the candidates basically do? You know what? They're not gonna tell you how to make things better. They're just telling you how sorry and stinky the other person is. That's basically, I mean, they're throwing mud. That's all they do, right? Again, I'll just tell you something that Satan will throw more mud on you than any political candidate throws on each other. That's his job. In fact, Satan in Hebrew means slanderer. He is the slanderer. Look at how Satan is described in the book, in the Bible, in Revelation chapter 12, verse 10. Look what God's word says. The accuser, that's Satan, of the brothers. He's the accuser of the brothers who accuses them before our God day and night. Now, a lot of us think that, okay, Satan's in hell and he's got a red suit on, he's got a pitchfork and he's, you know, shoveling coal. He's gonna one day be in eternal flames. He will be, but right now he's not. He roams this earth, tempts and tests us, and he also goes before God's very throne and he accuses us. That's what the Bible says. And he'll accuse us before God. You can see this in the book of Job. Job chapter one, what do you have? You have Satan coming into God's presence and he's gonna accuse God's people and God says, hey, how about my servant Job? And Satan says, well, God, the reason why he serves you because you bless him so much, you let me take away some of his blessings and he'll curse you to your face, right? The test was on. That's what Satan does. Satan will accuse you before God and then he'll send his little minions, demons, and they'll come and they'll whisper things in your head and you know what they'll say? They'll say, 
You no good, you no good, you no good. Baby, you're no good. I'm going to say it again, right? I mean, that's what happens. And they, they say, you're a hypocrite, you're a filthy, rotten sinner. I mean, God can't do anything with you, right? And then what will happen is, is that sometimes he'll use other people, maybe even other Christians, and they'll become the mouthpiece of Satan. And suddenly after a period of time, you've heard it so much that you believe it and you begin to think, you know what? God can't, doesn't want anything to do with me. I'm not worthy. Golly, I know the Bible says there's a feast, but the best I can ever do is the garbage can and that's where we live our lives. God says no. In times of accusation, do you know what you need to hang on to? Here it is, jot this down. Here's the principle, God pardons. In times of accusation, good news folks, God pardons. Now, those of you who know me well, you could stand and testify and say, you know what, Pastor Tony's character's flawed here, and boy, he, he, he should do that whenever he does, and he does this, and, and you know what, he, he shouldn't have said that, and you know what, all those things are probably true, but before God, they don't stick to me. Do you know why? Because God Almighty has declared me not guilty. Right, so who can lay a charge against one of God's elect? Well, look at how his answer. Verse 33 says this, God is the one who justifies. In your outline, circle the word justifies. That means not guilty. It means innocent, declared innocent, declared righteous. I said this last week. Anytime in the book of Romans that you see the word justified, think, just as if I've never sinned. God now looks at you, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, just as if you've never sinned. Is that because you're so righteous and so good? No, it's because Jesus Christ is so righteous and so good. It's because of him, that's why. Now, let me put it to you like this. Imagine, you know, in our country, our highest court is known as the Supreme Court. And you can appeal things all the way up to the Supreme Court. But once the Supreme Court makes its ruling, that's it, right? I mean, there, there's no place else to, to appeal it to after the Supreme Court. Well, think of it this way. If God Almighty is the one who declares you righteous and justified and not guilty, and he's the final judge, then who else can lay a charge against you? No one. You are declared innocent. All accusations have been pardoned. That's what God says. I love how this is written in the Old Testament. In Isaiah chapter 43 says this, God says, I am he who blots out your transgressions. I will remember your sins no more. I love that. I can just imagine that Satan brings a charge against me and says, God, you know your servant, Tony Wallace, sir. You know him. You know his struggles. You know his flaws. You, you, you see that sin right there? I mean, obviously, you remember all this, right, God? You know what God says? God says, yeah, I remember Tony Wallace, sir. I remember the night when he called out in desperation to my son Jesus to save him and forgive him. I remember that. And you know what? Everything else he's ever done, I got no memory of that. Why? Because I've cast his sins as far as the east is from the west, and I remember them no more. That's what the word of God says, that whenever Satan comes after you with accusations, you need to cling to the fact that God is for you, and he pardons you. Not guilty. Not guilty. So God's for us. In times of opposition, he will provide. In times of accusation, he will pardon but there's a third thing, jot this down. In times of condemnation, in times of condemnation, you see, sometimes Satan will beat us up so much that we actually believe his lies and we go, you know what, there is no use. I'm condemned, it's hopeless. I mean, you know what, I mean, God really doesn't want me around anymore. And we believe those lies of condemnation. And so Paul addresses that. He asks one final question in this passage. Look at it, it's found in verse 34. Who is the one who condemns? And you're outlined, circle the word condemns there, which is a good question. Who is the one that can condemn you? Right? I mean, now Satan can accuse you, but there's only one who can condemn you. In all the universe, there's only one who can condemn you. That's God, right? 
I mean, the Bible says this. The Bible says there's appointed unto man once to die and after that the judgment. That means that every one of you at one time or another are gonna die and you're gonna stand before Jesus and you're gonna be judged. You are. Christ is going to be the judge. We, ha- we get a picture of this found in the book of Revelation. In Revelation chapter 20, we see what's known as the great white throne judgment. It's white because it represents Jesus' purity. It's a throne because it represents his royalty. And Jesus is sitting on this throne and he's judging all of humanity. Look at it, it's an amazing scene. Revelation chapter 20, verse 11 says this. Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it, this is Christ. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne. That means that all of humanity, the rich, the poor, those that were affluent, those that were not, those that were struggling, those that were not, you name it, all of mankind is gonna stand before Jesus one day. And look what it says next. Standing before the throne and books were open. Notice it's plural. Many books were open. And another book, that's singular, was open, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books, plural. Verse 15, anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. Now, that's what condemnation looks like, folks, and it's a frightening scene. And the truth is, is that every one of us are one day going to have our judgment day. We're gonna stand before Jesus Christ. He will judge us. And there's gonna be books. I mean, imagine. When I stand before him, there's gonna be these books. And it probably be these books would stack as tall as this table here. And you know what? You open those books, and based on what's in those books, I'm going to hell. And every one of you would as well. We would all be judged based on what's on the books. We're all destined for condemnation. But aren't you glad there's another book? It's the book of life. It's the Lamb's book of life. And Jesus throws it down on top of all the other books. And his blood covers all of my sin. And he looks and your name's written in the Lamb's book of life. And he says, I don't care what's brought against him. No condemnation. That is the promise of God. So... Who is it that can condemn you? Jesus, Jesus alone. And yet, Paul says in this passage, as a follower of Jesus, he's not condemning you. You know what he's doing when you're struggling and having a hard time? He's praying for you. Jot that down. In times of condemnation, Jesus prays. This is hard to understand, but the only one who condemn us is actually praying for us. It's an incredible verse, amazing promise. It's found in verse 34. Look what God's word says. Christ Jesus, he's the only one that can condemn, but it's Christ Jesus, he's the one who died. Yes, rather, the one who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who is also interceding for us. And you're outlining, circle the word interceding, that means praying. You have the complete work of Jesus Christ found in that one verse. Jesus is the savior who dies for you. He is Lord who rose again and is seated on the right hand of the Father and reigns as Lord. And he is our great high priest who's ever living to make intercession for us. Now what happens is, is Satan comes and he's like this um, prosecuting attorney. And he goes, I've got this evidence against them. And Jesus raises his nail pierced hand and says, I've got more evidence for them. In fact, check it out. Look how this is written. In 1 John chapter 2, verse one says this, if anyone sins, and that's everybody in this room, you know that you have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. See that word advocate? That means he's your defense attorney. Satan comes at us and he throws his accusation and his condemnation. He goes, how can God ever use you? How can God ever bless you? How can God ever answer your prayers? I mean, look at your life. You blew plan A for God's God's plan for your life. You, You blown plan B for your life. I mean, you're on plan Z. Really, you think God's gonna bless you and work in your life now after all this mess you've been through? That's the lie. Now, now why? Why is Paul doing this for us? I'll tell you why Paul's going to such great lengths to tell us the security we have in Jesus Christ. I'll tell you why. Because most of us have the wrong image of God. See, we just imagine that God's up in heaven and he's always frowning, he's always mad, he, he always just like, oh my goodness, not again, not you. Like, last thing I wanna hear is your prayers. 
I don't know why I declared you righteous. I wish I would have thought about it before I declared you righteous because I sure want to kick you to the curb right now, right? I mean, is that just ridiculous? Well, I should have never made you born again. Brr, shouldn't give you the Holy Spirit because I sure want to take it away now, right? I mean, really? Is that God's conversation with us? Of course not. God knows us, and what does he do? He's your biggest defender. He's not the one that wants to kick you to the curve. He's the one that says, I'm praying for you. I know you can make it. I know you're struggling, but I'm lifting you up. When everybody else is kicking you down, God's lifting you up. That's what the Bible's saying here. Years ago, at U.S. Army bases, they were trying to determine um, why is it that some kids succeeded in school and others didn't. And part of the study, what they did, is they had the students draw pictures of their teachers. And it was real interesting to see that. And in this study, whenever you had kids that drew their teachers with smiling, happy faces, sort of like this, um, universally, 100% of the time, those kids did good in school. But those students that drew pictures of their teachers that were mean or mad or angry or grotesque, universally, those kids did bad in school. So here's the question. What's your picture of God? Is God against you? Or is it like what the Bible says, God's for you? Because I'm telling you, Satan's gonna come after you and he's gonna have his stack of evidence against you. He will. He will. I've got good news for you. Jesus has his evidence for you. I can imagine a scene like this probably has played out in heaven. That Satan's probably come at some time or another and said to God Almighty, God, why do you keep blessing those people at Silverdale Baptist Church? I mean, well, why are you blessing that church? I mean, <laughs> you see their pastor? I mean, he may preach the word, but you know, his prayers, you really call those prayers sincere? Why do you keep answering his prayers? And God says, I'll tell you why. Because he prays in the name of my son, that's why. And, and then Satan says, well, look at that church member there, and look at that one over there, and I mean, look, their back is always turned to you, God, they're always wayward. And God says, yeah, I see their back turned, but I see the back of my son that was beaten for their waywardness, and I'm gonna bring him back home. And, and, and God, what about that one over there? And what about that Christian right there? What about that one right over there? I mean, their hands always do evil. And God says, yeah, I see their evil, but I see my son's nail pierced hand who died for that evil. And, and, and God, listen to that person's speech and listen to that one, and that one's gossiping, and that one's critical, and that one's, you know, griping and complaining all the time. Do you hear their speech? And God says, yes, I hear their speech, but I also remember the speech of my son on the cross who said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. See, it doesn't matter what kind of evidence Satan has stacked up against us. Christ raises his nail-pierced hand and says, I've got more evidence for them. They are mine. I am for them. And folks, if God's for you, who can be against you? In times of opposition, God will provide. In times of accusation, he'll pardon. In times of condemnation, Jesus is praying for you. But you've gotta believe it. Can I tell you something? If you don't believe this, you won't live this. And you'll spend your Christian experience digging through the garbage cans of this life thinking something out there is gonna give you what you're looking for. And I'm telling you, it's found in Christ alone. Come to the feast and believe that our God is for us. He's for you.